Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Somewhere between science and superstition. We have such sights to show you. Strange Eons. Welcome to Strange Eons Radio. That's Eric over there. Yeah, hello. That's Vanessa over there. Hello. I'm Kelly. Um, wow, big news when uh, Netflix <laughs> stock dropped <laughs> Tripped hard. off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eric, you did a little research on this. What, what was the reason for it? Well, it depends on who you talk to, but the main reason seemed to be saturation. They just hit. Almost everybody in the world that wanted to have Netflix seemed yeah. to have Netflix. Yeah. So people weren't subscribing anymore because, you know, you were all around the world. We were locked in our houses basically for quite a while. Right. So mm -hmm. a whole lot of people probably subscribed that didn't subscribe in, you know, 2020 yeah. and still have it. Or there's also, if you're horror oriented, you probably have Shudder and Arrow or something like that or Tubi even. Right. Mm -hmm. In the grand scheme, they didn't lose that much. I was surprised it was such a dramatic hit, but... Yeah, they lost like, what was it? They thought they were going to gain 2.5 million and they lost 200,000 mm. subscribers. It's like, and they, what, dropped, what, 35% yeah. or something in their bad. stock? And it's Overvalued. Like, you guys, <laughs> that is ridiculous. That is a ridiculous reaction to losing 200,000 subscribers. Yeah, really weird. Plus, then all the numbers started coming out of the billions of dollars they are spending yeah. on new content and all that stuff. And it's it's kind of like, wow, this wow. is, I, I think you're right. It's not just saturated that way. It's saturated that it, everybody's a little tired of now having to pay for 16 different streaming right. sites if you want to even watch your television shows. Yeah, yeah. it's. Yeah. It's true, but I I still find this very strange that they are financially tied up. Is this because they're not l releasing the numbers of how many people are watching each show and how they're making a profit in that way? Because if they're relying completely for their stock to stay afloat based off of how many people have signed up for their service, that sounds like it was inevitable that it would hit a wall. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't understand this <laughs> this way of doing business at all. And they are notoriously stingy with their numbers. They they haven't ever released how they right. tell what is being watched. Yeah, watch. they exactly. won't even let you really review stuff now because it used mm -hmm. to be the star rating and now it's a thumbs up, thumbs down, yeah. which yeah. I'm terrified to mess with because I don't want them to be like, oh, you don't like one comedy. You don't like any comedy. Exactly, yeah. Except well, there, you don't like any comedy. So. I know. Bad example. <laughs> I, yeah, I do a thumbs down some comedies because of that. But they also lost a lot of their like evergreen titles. Friends went to HBO, Office went to Peacock, Star Trek went to Paramount Plus. So they had all those kind of things that people would watch over and over and over and over and over again mm. go away. So maybe they're like, you know, man, I, I want to watch The Office, but I'm not going to pay Netflix anymore because I don't give a shit about Squid Games or whatever. Wow, I didn't even think of that. So I guess I didn't realize that was a thing. So people were still watching Friends on Netflix? Yeah, it's... There's literally... Too much stuff to watch. Yeah. That's really good. And you're going to watch a show that went off the air 15 years ago? That, you know, yeah. that makes a lot of sense because um, you guys might not be aware, but teenage girls are wearing a lot of Friends memorabilia for no reason. Every time I go into Target, the young teen <laughs> area, it's just all like Friends stuff yeah. and has been for a few years. And I was like, what are you guys doing? But yeah, that is a, a deep yeah. pie, I guess. Yep. <clears throat> Exactly. Oh, man. Oh, so um, so one thing I actually wonder from, did you guys hear that their kind of way of dealing with this is that they're going to try to punish their viewers yeah. by get, making it Teared. difficult to um, have multiple people on the same account? Oh, right. Is that correct? Well, that's, I don't know if that's punishing so much because every other company in the world but Netflix is like, Hey, stop sharing your passwords. Right. And Netflix says, we don't care. Share your passwords. And now they're finally going, well, maybe not. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, which of course is going to annoy people who have been doing it for years. Right. Because why not? Right. They didn't care. <laughs> well, 
I wish they wouldn't make such a public display about it because I'm like, you guys, you don't have to tell everyone we're going to punish you if you <laughs> blow. You just sign them out. This is what happens to me with all the other um, subscription things. I just get signed out occasionally. And then I'm like, oh, well, I was mooching off of this rando dude I dated for less than one day and he felt bad and gave me his HBO login. I moved off that guy for two years and then got logged out and he was like, you know what? I'm just going to be an adult and make my own account. <laughs> yeah, I would say that, that, yeah, that uh, you got good. your money's worth out I of that sure one. I sure did. Yeah, no you know, it wasn't it, it wasn't that bad. It was a little awkward. And then I got two years of free HBO, yeah. so it was fine. <laughs> well, they're also talking about tiered pricing, like yeah. Hulu does, where you can pay a little bit more and not have commercials, but now you can Netflix, you can pay a little less and have commercials. I cannot like, handle those commercials. Oh boy. <laughs> That's freaking awful. You know, if the commercials play like they do in Hulu at the beginning of a show and then that's it, yeah. I'm fine. That's the time I make popcorn, all of that stuff. If they are going to take like, commercial breaks like through TV their TV or shows or something, yeah. yeah, then I'm going to gonna have to do something about that. Yeah. Something illegal, I mean, not actually pay more money. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. You know me. There you go. <clears throat> hey, Vanessa, I saw a movie that you were mm. talking about last week, and oh. I wanted to talk to you about it a little bit. Ooh. X. <gasps> yes. I saw it, too. Oh, my God, you guys. What did you think? I liked it. I would yeah. say that it's probably Ty West's best film yes. to date. Uh, yeah. I still thought it was excruciatingly slow until the third act. Yeah, I can see that. I liked it helped a little bit that as opposed to the House of the Devil, there's basically one character. Mm -hmm. And then the innkeepers, there's basically two characters. At least this one, you got like five or six people to follow yeah. in the slower yeah. parts. They but had yeah, a lot of fun slow. conversations about porn and they were making porn, you know? <laughs> that's that's the opening, like two thirds of the film. <laughs> yeah, I, I did love the uh, time setting. I thought yeah. the acting was really strong by yeah. everybody. It blew my mind to find out that the lead was playing the yeah. other person does well. I was like, what? I did not know this until <laughs> long after I finished watching the movie. And I was like, I mean, I thought she kind of looked similar in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I, that's cool that maybe they'll have her play that character when she's younger. That sounds cool. It, I feel very dumb. Well, I, yeah. I assumed that that was a younger person in makeup because of the things yes. they were having her do. Sure. And so I was just like, oh, okay. And then when the credits rolled and she was listed as <laughs> both names, I was, wow, that was really interesting. So then I had to look it up and see everything that they had to do to get her into that age makeup. And then, yeah, that uh, she will be playing now the younger version of her in the prequel. But I was mm -hmm. kind of like, do I need a prequel to this? No, not really. No. no. <laughs> but I think that... I don't know. I get the I get the idea that it was just easy to just keep filming and <laughs> get it done back to back. <laughs> so why not? It, oh, is that what they did? Yeah. Oh, okay. It, like that. he wrote them both, I think, during COVID and was just like, yeah, let's just keep going, guys. Oh, all right. Wow. Well, yeah, I would say that I I mostly enjoyed it just like I mostly enjoy all of his films. <laughs> I like this one better than most. It stuck with me as yeah. well. It was one of the rare things films do, like the original Texas Chainsaw, which of course this has a lot in common with, mm. is after it's done, it's still kind of sitting with you and feeling weird and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that accomplished that pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I think again, it's that weird um, ageism thing that like I didn't expect that in this movie where it's about, you know, an older woman and the way in which she has very human needs that um, are she's being shunned about and made fun of about and the reactions, the very human reactions. And I was like, I didn't expect this in this movie. Okay. I feel a lot of sympathy for this uh, character and it's very weird. Until. Until. Yeah. Uh, there was yeah. some, uh, there was some cool kills in it and oh, all that, geez, but I will uh, tell you and you tell me uh, the, the worst was watching the guy walk barefoot towards that nail sticking up. Oh. And I, I was, I, I literally covered my eyes. <laughs> uh, for me, it was a hundred percent when girl um, makes her way through the door she is locked behind and has her hand flailing around outside. And oh, I went, don't do that. Don't do that. This is going to be, 
it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. It's it's always fingers. God, I cannot handle when fingers get injured. It yeah. <laughs> it's always those things that we can truly relate to. You know? yeah. like stepping on something that hurts your foot is very relatable right. and cutting right. your fingers. As opposed you know. to getting a shotgun into the tummy. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Not, <laughs> yep. To the tummy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was shot to the tummy. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> Uncomfortable <laughs> silence. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. taking that in. Um, well, <laughs> I went to the theaters and I got to see a movie that um, it's pretty recent. I guess I'm about a week behind on it, but um, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I knew if anyone was going to see this, it would be you. Yeah. 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 You know, um, it was it was cute. Yeah, there's lots of, you know, it's like it's still a kids movie. I still can't necessarily recommend it because it's still a kids movie for kids. You recommended the first one hard, and I, I hated know. it. I know that's why <laughs> I can't recommend this one because I realized that you have no ability to separate separate yourself out from the fact that it is a children's film. I love a lot of children's films. All I need them to be is good. <laughs> the first Sonic was not very good. Um, there's, I think there's some good humor in this. Just, But again, I don't know. It de depends if you want to enjoy watching Idris Elba voice a very goofy, overly tough, but overly dumb character. That, that was a lot of fun. There's a lot of moments of this, um, you know, cartoony other Sonic character doing things like watching text messages going, dot, 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 while waiting for an incoming text to happen because he doesn't understand how certain things happen and just being like, what are sprinkles? Like, these are these are fun moments to me. They might not be fun <laughs> moments to you. I can almost guarantee it. Yeah, it seems that way. Mm. Well, uh, one of the movies I had to discuss was X, but I do have another one as a backup, which was a lot of fun, which is, ironically, a Netflix exclusive, I believe. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, metal Lords. Oh, yeah. Have seen I have not seen it, but it looks good. It does it's look fun. good. It is nothing you don't expect, and it is spot on predictable on what is going to happen where and when and how, but I didn't care because it was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. And um, I don't know. It was just fun. It was a metal movie of high schoolers learning to come together to be able to play music, and uh, they use uh, War Pigs. As one of their the guy playing the drums used that as his way to learn the drums. So that's kind of cool. You hear that a lot. Although I was a little disappointed that the guitar player, who's sort of the ass but not really character, mm. has a car that has a license plate that's basically abbreviated Power Slave. And they never played that song. <laughs> Come on. <Aww. laughs> it's that's in, a huge like, bummer. Seven scenes. You see this guy's license plate. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, as a metalhead, it's fun. To, it's fun to watch just for all the references and the the get together at the end. The battle of the bands is a lot of fun. This nothing, like I said, nothing new, but really fun to watch. It's a movie, right? Not a yeah. series. Okay, yeah, that's on my list. It looked cute. Yeah, exactly. That's a good Steve word. Even I like cute movies. Uh huh. I didn't. <laughs> kids' movies, not cute movies. <laughs> You guys are going to have to forgive me. My allergies are going crazy today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a movie we have all seen also, just because I think it needs to be spoken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Moonfall. Oh, Oh, not the yeah. one I thought you were going to say. <laughs> oh. uh, Moonfall, you guys. Vanessa. Yes. <laughs> you uh, recommended this to me. Yeah. And I watched that thing, mostly <laughs> with my mouth hanging open the whole time, because I was like, what? What the <laughs> fuck is going on in this movie? I uh, I loved the shit out of it. Aww. It was so stupid. <laughs> yes. yes. That's why it it's like so hard to talk about because it's like, it's not a good movie. It's 100% a bad film, but it's also so fun. It is so bonkers. Yeah. And I, the reason for the moon falling was not <laughs> what I was expecting. <laughs> I was... <laughs> <laughs> expecting, I don't know, some bullshit natural phenomenon that they were going to try and push on this idea. Of, no, 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 no. Somebody is using the moon against us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that they just go for it, too. They're not just like a little hint or a small, oh, yeah, an asteroid hit the moon and now the moon's out of whack and now it's coming. No, it's like the moon is this other 
thing. And we are fully going into it. We are a hundred percent team. We're going to go check this out and the the reasons why it's happening and the people who may or may not be involved and a hundred percent like back third of the film. There are moments when the moon is causing the earth's gravity Mm. to turn off (laughs) and things go flying in the air as the earth gets closer. And, uh, it was all so much bullshit yeah. that I just, I was like, you must think we are all fucking idiots. I, I total you're probably right. Disrespect for the audience. Uh-huh. I, uh, <laughs> I ended, and I, I mean, I was texting you guys while I was watching it going, what is happening? <laughs> and then I texted a few people afterwards. I'm like, you have got to see Moonfall. <laughs> I will watch it again if you want to come over. We'll watch it right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think the word, cause that kind of stuff is so much fun. The things I didn't enjoy were a couple of the characters and some of the writing, some of the editing. That what? was some that of the writing? special effects. Yeah, some no, of the, the special effects were fun. Oh, it had some horrible green screen. Well, I don't mean the big ones. I mean, little <laughs> shitty green screens, oh, like okay. running across the bridge or something. Oh, where like, sure. oh my God. <laughs> 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 I can all do their... better with my iPhone and my computer than you guys with your hundred plus million dollar budget did for these. There's a handful of scenes. There's like five or six of those. I was like, oh my God, because the rest is so good. Yeah. And those just <laughs> sore thumb themselves. Right? I was like, wow. Yeah. I also, I think I told you guys that, I mean, the movie was so stupid that it needed Gerard Butler in it. It did. I felt like it should have been a Gerard Butler movie instead. And I love all of his movies too, but he is in the worst fucking movies. Yeah. This was like, what? You didn't get the call for this one? (laughs) I feel like, what was the other one that he was in? Was it Greenland? Yes. Yeah. I think after Greenland, he was probably like, I'm going to take a little break from these guys. (laughs) And they're like, who else can we get? Oh, look at that guy from the uh, horror movie series. Um, (laughs) Well, I'm glad you checked it out. That's, I didn't expect you to say, Moonfall. I thought you were going to say Moon Knight. Yeah. Oh, fuck you guys. Not not going with it, huh? Um, I Do you guys ever have like that um that favorite aunt that would give you the best Christmas presents and everything? <laughs> uh-huh. Moon Knight feels to me like my favorite aunt showed up and I got a pair of socks for Christmas. Oh, <laughs> and I'm just like, "What the This is not what I wanted. <laughs> you knew what I wanted and you gave me this?" I am so bummed with Moon Knight. What is it that is bumming you out about it? Because I, I have my thoughts, but... Well, first, I, I just don't think anything is happening. Mm-hmm. I'm just tired of this story already. I'm, I'm not, not, not tired of it. I'm bored with it. I'm like, would like to see something happen. Some more Moon Knight would be fine. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, watching this bumbling Stephen Grant... And the the hints at Jake Lockley. There's two episodes left. How are they going to tell any story here? <laughs> it's it is it is really weird. I mean, I'm not sold, and I have confused concerns. I it feels I don't know. It feels like maybe they they read one Moon Knight, and that's the Moon Knight they're doing, which is the Lamar uh, mm. Moon Knight. And that's fine, but they should have done that from like page or not page one from episode one, if that's what they're going to do. So I'm like, how are you guys? I've read Lamar's Moon Knight. You're not going to get through it. You're trying, but you're starting so far (laughs) in and there's so much to do. I just don't see how this is going to function. So I, yeah, it feels like it's, they don't know what they're, they want. It's like Indiana Jones sometimes. And this character we really care about for two seconds, but then we forget about, and then we do this one and why we had to see what's his name, go and talk to the gods and be like, no, I'm not, I'm not bad. It's fine. I'm like, they're gods. They could just go over to the pyramid and check. (laughs) Why don't they do that? They're like, oh, just going to take this dude's word for it. He says I'm evil and I'm not. It's fine. I have sandals. Like, and that's okay. (laughs) I don't, I'm not in love with it, but I'll, you know, I'll watch the rest. I think for this one, and maybe it's because when I sat there with the anticipation, Moon Knight and Halo were really, really close together. Right. Mm. As far as, man, I can't wait to see either one of these. 
Moon Knight, I at least feel touches on what the fuck Moon Knight is occasionally. Mm -hmm. And it's trying. It's just not succeeding quite as well. And Halo was such an abysmal failure yeah. and hit no notes and failed on everything that at least I... there's not much story in Moon Knight, but there's a story. <laughs> and we have Oscar Isaac. And we do have a lead that's worth watching on screen. But yeah, yeah I don't. It, I, I've given up trying to figure out where it's going or what it's doing because I'm just, okay, let's just, we'll go with it. What was the super crazy uh, X-Men based TV show that was really cool? Legion. 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 Mm -hmm. Like, okay, maybe, maybe the last two episodes will be Legion-esque and at least be interesting to watch, but yeah. I, I'm also bothered. So um, Oscar Isaac has basically come out and said he's not, portraying Moon Knight after this series. It's not going to get really? a second. Well, you know, they're calling it a limited series instead okay. of a anything else. So, mm -hmm. so knowing that this thing has to wrap up Holy its story <laughs> in two episodes makes me think, well, I don't know how you guys are going to possibly do it. They haven't even like introduced the, they keep hinting at the third personality, but they haven't even brought yeah. him out yet. Right. And then <laughs> here's, here's the thing, even with shows that I didn't love, like Hawkeye, mm -hmm. um, when that, when a new episode released, I was right there. I forgot oh, that yeah. Moon Knight came on last Wednesday and yeah. I watched it the next day because I was like, oh yeah, new Moon Knight. I guess I'll watch this. Yeah. So, and that should say a lot because I love Moon Knight. Well, I had to watch the last two back to back because I did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh so. shit. Hold on. There's four episodes out now. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the cool thing about this is I have gone out and bought a bunch of old various Moon Knight runs <laughs> that I'm excited to jump into. So there's it, it that. It is neat to see him finally, uh, well done or not, shown that it's not, this is really, everybody always called him a Batman clone. Right. Because he's yeah, not. He's not. But I mean, early on he kind of was, but mm. then they nixed that. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, he's not. The, the <laughs> irony is they could have made him the Batman clone version because the new Batman yeah. isn't anything like Batman. True. So it's not true. like he's ripping anything off now. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Speaking of Batman, should we talk about Batman now or do you want to hold that for a longer discussion? I would like to, uh, I mean, we could talk about it now if you want to edit it towards the end of the episode. I'd like to do a spoiler oh, okay. discussion that yeah. uh, we can all get into what actually happened. I feel like if you wanted to see the movie, you have seen it now, but I would like to talk some of the beats. Sure. And, yeah. uh, and see what you guys think. So uh, mm -hmm. stay tuned after the episode for a, for a heavy dose of Batman talk. can see with onions, mushrooms, or pepperoni. You could lose if you have to switch, so you'd better be sharp. You better be slick. Party. Pizza party. Come on. Party. Pizza party. And we're back. Eric, this was your subgenre. Yes, it was. Party all the time. Party all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, for those that know me, you know how ridiculous that is. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, I figured we'd do... That scene from Raw just always has stuck with me, as I've commented many times. The insanity mm. of being a veterinarian student, and then you party like it is the hardest thing to do that job every day. So, <laughs> well, I did not find a movie that had that kind of parties, but I did find a weird-ass film. <clears throat> mm. 1981... Allison's birthday. If there is a spirit in the room, please move the glass towards the yes. Who is it? Uh, uh, Allison! Man is coming! I like this movie. Have you seen this one? Okay, yeah. cool. It's it's in the box set, right? Yep. It's yeah. part of the, all the Haunts BRs. Mm -hmm. uh, the Rotten Tomatoes has no critics ratings. 
and a 14, Ouch. which is insanely low for this film from the crowd. Yeah, no budget or anything like that. Never mind. <laughs> Directed by Ian Coakland, uh, who is known greatly for his TV movie, People Like Us. No? Uh -huh. Okay. The Restless Years, 673 episodes he directed. Whoa. The Restless Years. Yeah, I don't huh. know that. Maybe it's an Australian oh, soap sure. opera or something. Mm -hmm. And The Young Doctors, which he directed 33 episodes. Mm. He also wrote the film and 673 episodes of The Restless Years. Uh, the Prisoner TV series. Ah. Um, 31 episodes. So I don't know if that's the prison, the, that's a British TV show. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and Neighbors wrote 106 episodes of that. Yeah. So Neighbor. he's got some writing chops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stars Joanne Samuel, who's in Mad Max, My Pet Dinosaur, and the Wiggles movie. Oh boy. Getting some Australian cred down here. <laughs> uh, Lou Brown, Going Down. And The Boy in the Bush and Midnight Spares. So I, I don't know any of those. <laughs> uh, Bunny Brook, who's in number 96, 218 episodes of that TV show. And Cornflakes for Tea. <laughs> and 125 <laughs> episodes of E Street. And uh, John Bluthal has 140 credits overall. He's been in set, uh, Labyrinth, Superman 3, The Fifth Element, Help. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Don't raise the bridge, lower the river. <laughs> but anyways, he's been in a lot. So this starts with one of those, I don't know if you've seen these in films, but it's kind of a different version of Ouija board where it lays out what kind of looks like Scrabble pieces. Mm -hmm. And then you put the, a glass in the middle and it moves around between them. Uh, so it had that kind of a seance with a very specific message for Allison. Do not go to your birthday. <laughs> you know what? If you get that specific of a note from a Ouija board, maybe don't go to your birthday. It was beyond just the Ouija board. The A voice took over her friend and is speaking <laughs> and saying, I'm your dead father. And then Poltergeist Crazy kills the girl who is talking with her father's voice. I go, yeah, yeah. You know what? <laughs> you should stay home. <laughs> like, oh, my, my God. God. Because it just before he gets killed, he goes, they're coming for me or something like that. It's like, oh, all right. <laughs> Wait, he did not go to the good place, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, I would, I would. It's a great opening. Mm -hmm. It sets up this the film quite well and uh, makes you go, hmm, some shit is definitely going down in this film. And then the uh, credits roll with a mini looking uh, Stonehenge. Running through the goods. Like, oh, I see what you're doing here. And hey, Allison has a cool job. She works at a record store. <laughs> That's a pretty cool job. <laughs> that you can't do anymore. And apparently this is vitally important because while she, when they first show her again, I think it's like three or four years later, uh, words pop up on the screen telling you the exact age and hour, last day and hour she was born, which is important to the storyline. Right. Oh, okay. And no, I didn't take notes of what the exact date was. <laughs> That's okay. Um, her boyfriend then also works, has a cool job. He works at a radio station. Of course, the radio station does have a Barry Manilow posters on the background, but hey, you know. <laughs> cool. Popular at the time. Um, and a very strange scene uh, where the aunt, his aunt, her aunt calls to convince her to come. Where it's, they're watching TV, I think, and then it's a shot of the phone and it rings and then it cuts back to her and a shot of the phone and it rings and it cuts back to her. It's like, this is very odd, but it's not ineffective. And so, you know, by the time she picks up the phone, it's like, what is going on? And it's her aunt telling her, her aunt and uncle who raised her really want her to be there because her uncle is dying and he's very sick and he doesn't know. Which doesn't hold up at all, because as soon as they show up, he's perfectly fine, and they never mention it again. <laughs> she never asks. <laughs> they don't offer any explanation. That's a hell of a way to get somebody to come to their birthday party. <laughs> That's right. The film continues to do a good job of creating dread and getting a creepy feeling going with um, introduction of this weird wall and gate in the back. And the adults are saying, well, don't go back there. It's grown over and there's like snakes and stuff. It won't go well. So you just don't go back there. So of course, immediately does. 
And the scene when she goes back there, she goes and finds the recreation of Stonehenge. And then the sound alters. The sound gets really weird and interesting. The music kicks in really well. And you get this strange, almost Friday the 13th kind of breathing sound going on, scaring the hell out of her. So, you know, she's hearing it too, which is really cool. And so she, you know, she immediately runs back into the, <laughs> the backyard. <laughs> like, well, that wasn't a good idea. Uncle just totally dismisses it when she talks about it. But then in the second story window of the house, you see some older lady staring at her. <laughs> like, ah. So the film is really smart in its buildup of suspense, its buildup of what is going on, teasing little moments and things that go on that without actually telling you what's happening. Mm. Um, part of it is that like when I was reading off the actors, they're all very, very skilled and well done. And he's a skilled director who knows where to put the camera and things along those lines. So it, it works. I'm stunned at the 14 on this film. <laughs> so um, she gets another scare by we awakened in the, by a woman in a wheelchair. Uh, if you're really paying attention to this film, you will see where it's going. Yeah, the mystery is lightly veiled. It's mm. not heavily veiled. Um, but and that's fine. Don't take away from it. Um, because it's not set up as a if you don't figure out what's going on, you if you don't get a surprise at the end of the movie, it will ruin you. It's not built that way. So it's perfectly fine if you oh, I think I know where this is going. Right. Mm -hmm. Um the parents are continuing to try to lock her away from everybody around her with uh her boyfriend showing up and trying to hang out with her a little bit more and them not letting her. And that kind of goes bad at one point where it's bad enough that they're like, okay, they bring in a doctor who drugs her and hypnotizes her to say that he attacked her or the people in the house. And uh, the cops believe that of course. So he gets in trouble, which then is a strange point of the film. It switches to him as the key character mm -hmm. and she very much goes into the background for a little while, which isn't unusual in a film like this where, you know, somebody's being set up for some kind of a sacrifice or some kind of a ceremony. Uh, so he takes over and, um, <clears throat> they decide he, he goes to an, an old friend who is a, an occult master. And she explains the, what is going on and what is that in a little bit too much of a, Hey, let's just info dump. Yeah. During that time she has a, or before that a little bit, she has a, a um, dream of pretty much what's going to happen. And the <laughs> chanting and their chanting almost sounds like they're saying some weird combination of Excalibur and murder, <laughs> which it's, it's not. Excalibur murder. It's some kind of, <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of a, a demon or something named like Myrna is what they're chanting. But it sounded weird until the info dump. I go, oh, that's what they were saying. <laughs> I get it now. Uh, so they decide Pete's getting too close. So let's kill the boyfriend. <laughs> like, oh, shit. So we then get the most casual car race, car chase scene you've seen in a film <laughs> where they just leisurely drive along the, uh, the area until until he decides to jump out and jump into a grave, which apparently they knew he was going to do because there's a whole bunch of guys in tuxedos for whatever reason. Hmm. And they're to kill him. Not sure why. I still don't know why the tuxedos, because it never comes back again. It's not like these are that you then see them later on at the ceremony and they're wearing tuxes because it's formal. No, they're wearing robes. So I'm like, uh, okay, sure. Why not? And this kind of informs what's going to happen for the rest of the film, which I'm just going to leave out there. Mm -hmm. If you've been listening, you probably already know kind of where it's going. But this is actually a pretty fun film. And I think it's well worth watching. So I don't really want to necessarily go through the whole end. That's a good solid 50 minutes or so of the movie. What will happen? What will happen at the party? Will she survive? Will Pete help? Are the aunt and uncle creepy? Or just really creepy? <laughs> <laughs> So, They're really straddling the line between creepy and really creepy. Exactly, yes. <laughs> They're going to be one of the two. Oh, they only had one tagline. I was a little disappointed. Satan's only gift is death, which is weird because it's not really satanic. It's a demon, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, oh, no, there's another one. A young girl comes of age and an evil destiny awaits her. 
She'll never forget her party. Neither will you. Ah. <laughs> that was a hell of a party. Yeah, yeah it's pretty, <laughs> pretty wild. So this is an Australian film, and uh, lucky in that Australian Film Commission paid for it. So it's a government-funded film. Uh, kind of falls into that exploitation realm. Mm. The, the extras on the disc include extended interviews from um, Not Quite Hollywood. They, they mine a lot of stuff from that for their extras on Severin. This is its first release since its original VHS. This is first. It has not been available in, in a media for a long time. Somewhat successful, but its most important horror contribution to um, Australia is it's one of the earliest, if not the first, urban-based horror Australian film. Almost all other Australian films are, you know, in the outback. Mm. Running around, being scared of the locals, kind of hillbilly stuff. The movie also states it's kind of the, it's not Australian lore. It's imported from England, from the UK. They borrow the, so they're, the Australians are sort of say, hey, we aren't the demon worshiper problems. <laughs> this comes from you guys across the, well, it's probably not across the pond when you're in Australia. <laughs> but uh, so that's part of what it's getting at. And so that was, okay, sure. <laughs> That really doesn't impact the movie one way or the other, but it's interesting that that's how they presented it. Uh, you know, you also may name Joanne, one of the lead, the lead lady who plays Allison, was Mad Max's wife oh. in Mad Max. So recognizable there. Uh, this film is also part of the Satanic Panic in Australia. Shortly after the U.S. trial uh, failed, in, and it was proven that it was all crap that they were making up. It came to Australia, and they all said, well, it's really happening here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, it's not. <laughs> it all began very similarly to it did in the U.S. with the Geraldo Rivera news report basically being taken word from word and represented from an Australian uh, reporter. Wow. <laughs> now, so I, this is kind of in the extra, so interesting stuff. Like there was a woman named Ro Rosaline Norton, who's almost kind of an Australian Anton LaVey. Uh, she's a bisexual artist who is also the subject of art. Uh, very unusual looking woman, really hard arched eyebrows, big angular face, very severe looking. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was very active in Australia in the 40s and 50s. Books were banned, not allowed to come to the U.S., um, and, uh, but was eventually re-released in the US in the 80s hmm. <laughs> and spawned a series of things like plays and a documentary about her called The Witch of King's Cross. And King's Cross was where evil came together and is an inner city part of Sydney mm. where, um, well, like Sailors would go as a red light district is that kind of thing. Um, so it was stoked. And then, of course, along The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby and The Omen also were huge hits there and influenced that. The extras on the disc are really interesting, too, the story of her. And it's a very hard disc to watch. That part was hard to watch because the lady narrating it was talking like this. And going, it's like, oh, pause, take a note. <laughs> Jesus, man. But um, yeah, it, along with uh, 1972's Night of Fear, which obviously much order. Uh, are kind of the kickoff for some of the horror styles. And that one was very Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Hillbillies, which is a movie that had no lines of dialogue and no character's name. Mm -hmm. But I've seen that one too. It's really good. So uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed this one. The party scene is yeah. not raw. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a ceremony, but uh, right. it happened. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like this movie. I think, uh, I don't know if it's good, but it's creepy Yeah, and weird. And that was enough for me. I saw this uh, when I was homesick for oh, a so week. Mm -hmm. so fairly recently. recently. Yeah. Nice. And it, I think I found it through other than legal means, but I believe sure. it is now streaming on Shudder or Arrow. So I yeah, saw I it pop up and I was like, what? <laughs> I think Shudder has the, several of the folk movies from yeah. that box that are available through there. Yeah, they seem to have gotten quite a few. Yeah, so you were saying this, um, it hadn't had a proper release since VHS? Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I had to find it in a different way, and mm -hmm. so now it just got released. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I liked it enough that I would want to buy it, but I, right. yeah. I'm i glad that it's out there to be seen again. 
Mm. As part of the box set, it's a great addition. It's a great part of it. As an individual movie, I would have been a little annoyed if I'd picked it up as a you know, $40 right. special edition right. from Severin. What did you see? Well, um, <laughs> I guess my party film possibly had quite a bit more party than your party <laughs> yeah, film. Probably. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I was looking around and there were some really great options out there, but I found this really weird, I want to say like a hidden gem. I don't know if that's the case, but like this film I had not come across before, probably because the title, so the title is called Plus One. Oh. But it's not spelled P L U S space O N E, right. except for sometimes it is. It is. <laughs> it is the plus sign, and then the actual numerical number one. Hello. I wish I could be there. I know. Me too. Look over here. Hi. Hi. This summer is going to be a very, very fertile one. I don't know if that was summer like last summer. I mean, last summer it was great. Yeah, it was. But this year is going to be better. No, without you. I think if we don't make up tonight, it's over. Holy. <laughs> My boys, very bright. Thank you. Enjoy the festivities. What the hell is this? It's a body buffet. Help yourself. Mm, you do birthdays? Where is Joe? I just saw her in the living room. I was just there. Well, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, man. I kind of think that you're into me. You are out of control. Joe, I just want to apologize. You don't even know what you're apologizing for. It's not for the kiss. You made me feel replaceable. You already got your chance. And every second that passes is the second that you don't get to get back. Holy f- Where did these people come from? Who's out there? Everybody. Everybody's out there and they're down here too. Oh my God. I see you. You're looking for Jill just like before. Wait a minute. Everything is going to happen again? Or we could change then? I don't want to change. This was the best night of my life. I'm going down there. Who are they? They're us, but they're not us. I just saw Jill upstairs. Wait, which one? I don't know. Let's try this again. Something happened with the power outage. They're gaining on us in time, and that means they might catch up to us. What happens if they do catch up? I mean, what does that mean for us? I'm really sorry. For what? For exactly. making you feel replaceable. I know we only get one chance, and every second that passes is gone forever. Where did you hear that? Just give me another chance. How many chances do you get? Then what? Huh? Who's gonna be left? Us or them? We get them before they get us, and they won't be catching up with anybody. Uh, which makes it very hard to find. Um, and it also has another title, which is Shadow Walkers. So it's got three different titles. Um, and this movie's from Weird. 2013. So that's, to me, pretty unusual. And it's not a foreign film either. It's just an indie film. So uh, I'm not quite sure what was going on there. <clears throat> this movie, movie has a really interesting Rotten Tomatoes uh, stretch of 82% from the critics. Uh, out of 11 reviews and 39% from the audience. So a bit of a dip. Wow. I've never even heard of this movie. It had 11 critics yeah. review it. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this, I'm but... looking forward to this review. Yeah. So um, directed by, uh, directed slash written by Dennis Iladius. Il He's done eight things. So Delirium, he actually directed the 2009 Last House on the Left uh, remake. He did a movie called Hardcore from 2004, which looked like another independent movie and a lot of shorts. And it was also, um, the screenplay was written by Bill Gullow, who's done six things, including The Quitter, Couples, and some shorts. So these are not well-known filmmakers. Um, it's starring a lot of very B-level um, people. We've got Reese Wakefield as the main character, David. He's been in 28 things. Um, most recently, he plays Dick Cheney in The First Lady. Um, but he was in a film that you watched, Kelly, Bliss. So he was in there. And um, he's been in a few episodes of True Detective. Logan Miller plays his friend, Teddy. 
Um, he's been in 49 things, including Scout's Guide to the Apocalypse, but I knew him from Escape Room and Escape Room 2. Oh. So, and apparently he he does a lot of voice work for the um, Guardians of the Galaxy TV series slash Ultimate Spider-Man, where he does the voice of Nova. Ashley Hinshaw uh, plays Jill, the girlfriend, sort of ex-girlfriend. She's been in 29 things, uh, including True Blood, True Detective, Chronicle, and a bunch of TV stuff. Natalie Hall plays the hot blonde Melanie, who's been in 38 things, including True Blood. My God. (laughs) 179 episodes of All My Children, Pretty Little Liars, and Charmed. So these are just pretty teens, essentially. Um, Avid... Adam David Thompson, who looked very familiar to me. He's a drug dealer. He's been in 40 things, including Glass, Vampires vs. the Bronx, uh, The Sinners, and The Outsiders TV series, and a bunch of Mozart in the Jungle. So I think he's just somewhere. However, he was also the bartender in Martha Macy May Marlene. And I was like, maybe that's where I know you from. You're the bartender who she freaks out at. And then um, last but not least, Colleen Dengel, uh, plays Allison, um, who's kind of the, the female friend who follows them around. Um, she's been in eight things, including Devil Wears Prada, where she must have been like an infant. Uh, <laughs> National Treasure, again, must have been infant. And then uh, The Woodsman. She played a lot of uncredited schoolgirls. So, ah, and this is the most recent thing she's The been. film? That is the yeah, film. Yeah, I've seen this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? No it one is to cares. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like somebody knows where I'm coming from. Um, so the plot, uh, college student David arrives as a surprise uh, to see his girlfriend Jill compete in a fencing uh, kind of giant competition. Um, she's kind of taken aback to see him. She's uh, happy-ish, but also <laughs> like, why are you here? Um, and he's also kind of taken aback because she's dyed her hair a new color and he feels like she's changed since he saw her last. Um, I assume they go to different schools, but then that doesn't seem to track later. So um, she's she definitely seems thrown off by him being there. And as a result, she seems to lose her competition. Afterwards, uh, he goes to find her in the, in the halls and approaches the wrong girl from behind uh, because apparently all girls who do fencing have the same ponytail with the same color hair. Um, <laughs> and he, he's very close to her and says something. She turns around and this other girl um, sees him and kisses him um, right as his girlfriend Jill is walking out of the changing room to see him kissing the girl that she just lost in competition to. <laughs> so she storms <laughs> off and some time passes. They have clearly broken up. Uh, David is talking to his roommate, Teddy, trying to figure out how to get her back. There's a big party that's going to happen that night. And Teddy is basically trying to convince him to go and find another chick because this is the college time when you go and have a bunch of sex and girls just want to have your dick, dude. Like (laughs) Teddy is really all about (laughs) making sure that he gets his time to shine in college. Um, But David is convinced he wants to try and win her back. Um, He has a real like Dawson Creek energy. Dawson of Dawson's Creek. Oh my. Yeah, that, that should give you a very firm idea of exactly what he looks like and how he acts. He's very tall, blonde hair, a little awkward, uh, wants to be of the moment, but isn't a little too smart, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they get down to the party and it is already in full swing. They run into their friend, Colleen. Um, she is definitely an awkward, shy girl clearly doesn't really know what to do with herself. And she's like, hey, guys. And they um, immediately kind of abandon her regardless. So Teddy goes off to find um, hot chicks to bang. He immediately finds this girl, Melanie, and he tries to woo her with some bad jokes, which she seems to actually be working because she says, come on upstairs. <laughs> David keeps seeing Jill and keeps following her on the party, but can't find her. He can't catch up with her. So he's like, where is Jill? Oh, she's in the living room, man. Oh, I was just there. So there's a sort of weird thing going on where he's um, just can't seem to get her. Plus, he sees she's flirting with this other hot guy at the party. Um, so he's desperate to catch her before she has sex with him because apparently that is like going to happen for sure. And it would be <laughs> the worst. So um, finally, David manages to catch up with Jill. Um, he takes her to a private room and he says, I really want to apologize Uh, But the way he apologizes, he messes up super bad and she leaves even angrier than before. Meanwhile, a meteor goes overhead 
electricity flickers in a strange way. Uh, the pole, it has like all this weird electric happening. There's a lot of phasing of like the lens and strange colors. It, it does kind of remind me of moments from um, Colorado Space. Just this interesting effect visually where it's not quite telling you what's happening, but you know something weird is happening. So uh, while that goes on, uh, Teddy goes upstairs to have very intense, brutal sex with Melanie where she slaps him a lot. Um, and then she goes into the shower. But... Um, the lights go out, and when the lights come back on, she's in the shower, but she's also in bed with him again. But she seems to be a little bit in the past because she's like, wow, how'd you get here so quick? Like, let's have sex again. He's like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> looking at her in the shower, looking at her, in, her next to him. Um, and in fact, this has not just happened with Melanie. This has happened with everybody. So um, Teddy runs away and locks the two Melanies in the room together <laughs> and looks like they might murder each other. Um, David, meanwhile, um, sees the drug dealer outside who's been waiting to... He's pissed because he wasn't invited to the party. And he's like, dude, I supplied you guys with drugs and you're not even letting me here. And so he's sitting on the hood of his car and a second version of him appears and one of them shoots the other. So suddenly David's like, oh my God, there's doubles and they're here to murder us all. Um, not quite sure what is happening. So um, uh, David and um, Teddy, David and Colleen, um, they all huddle upstairs trying to figure out what to do as they see their doubles recreate, you know, and maybe half an hour before downstairs. Um, he, uh, David watches himself st uh, searching for Jill um, Colleen watches herself and her double downstairs and she knows that she's about to get humiliated by a guy, like a, a dude who's like hits on her and then it's like, oh, I would never date you. You're such a loser and like walks off while his girlfriend's like, ha, see, told you you're a loser. So, um, everyone's kind of struggling with what to do with their kind of past selves living out their lives. So, um, Teddy is like, we should not interact with them. And, uh, Colleen's like, I got to go downstairs and basically goes to try and save herself from being humiliated. And David also tries to go downstairs to figure out what to do. However, while he's downstairs, he sort of realizes that he has this great opportunity to maybe have that conversation again, but not fuck it up with this girlfriend <laughs> that he's desperate to get back together with. So he's like, oh man, I got a second chance. Um, so he goes upstairs, um, to have the conversation again. And this time he does a lot better and it ends with her kind of being like, all right, maybe I will give you a second chance. Teddy is still trying to keep a distance from everybody. And Colleen just follows her other self around trying to protect her. Basically, as the party rages on, we have more power outages that happen. And each time a power outage occurs, the doubles seem to get a little bit closer in time to the originals. So it's almost like they're catching up. And what'll happen when they meet in the timeline, no one is totally sure. If uh, So all of a sudden, more and more people are starting to realize that there are doubles and there are weird things happening. And some of them with their doubles are like murdering them. Because they're like, uh, this person's going to replace me. I don't know what they're here for. Teddy and um, uh, Colleen both talk to their doubles, and it seems like they're just them. It is just them, but having lived a very slightly different experience because of this doubling effect and um, things moving and shifting. So it's them, but out of phase by just a little teeny tiny bit. Uh, so that's kind of the, the question for the rest of this movie is what was what going to happen. At one point, there's sort of this interesting all out war where doubles reappear right next to the originals and they start just beating on each other. One chick gouges off the other's eyes. One is strangling the other. Like there's a lot of rough shit that goes <laughs> on. And um, how does it end? Do which which ones survive? How does it all work <laughs> out? My thoughts, the ending really <laughs> sucks. Oh. Yeah, it feels really weak. It's, it feels very Twilight zone -y. Like, it's a very sci-fi heavy. It, it reminds me a lot of Coherence, but not quite as good and not quite as poignant. The, the importance, the changes, the reasons, they're all pretty loose, and I don't feel very satisfied by it. However, there are interesting moments. This doubling effect is kind of neat. Um, 
one of the clues they have as to the the doubling and how it's been working is there's a bird in a cage and all of a sudden there's two birds in a cage. There's a guy who's passed out on a couch through this entire movie and he gets like another one of him on the couch next to him also passed out. So there's <laughs> kind of these like little fun moments here and there. Um, uh, and I liked this instinct of trying to be the right one. I feel like that landed really hard seeing these people look at their others and <laughs> and feel that instinctive I have to end you because only one of us can exist. So that was good. Um, trivia. <laughs> uh, taglines. Only one. Everyone wants one. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the, the director denies um, that this film was ever a horror movie, although um, a lot of people seem to think it is. He claims it was a science fiction film. Um, however, in another interview, he explained that in an attempt to make the movie more interesting when combining several genres, he ended up using some horror-like tendencies. He also said in order to figure out how to write this movie, he asked himself three questions. One, what would happen if you could meet yourself? Two, what would happen if you're in the same space with yourself and both versions of you were going after the same thing? And three, what if this space was a wild party where all the emotions are raw and there's no time to be intellectual and process things? Lola visual effects helped produce the images and duplicate um, the, the d duplicates interacting with one another by using um, visual effects and CGI. They had a facial rig, which they had made specifically for the social network, which they used to make these duplicates. They recorded a person interacting with another person wearing the same clothes and then recreated the scene in another facility with a rigid chair inside of um, a bank of LED panels that surrounded the actor. And then they merged the footage together in order to create a duplicate interacting with the footage. I feel like that's a long way to go yeah, to make this. But um, uh, unfortunately, I didn't, I wasn't able to find any budget or box office. So I don't know how much it costs to make this. I think part of the reason why there wasn't a budget box office is because it premiered at South by Southwest and was bought by IFC. I don't think it really had a, a theater viewing. There's some fun Amazon reviews. Roger gives it one out of five stars. This was not a real digital order. It was done by Alexa because my wife didn't know how to use the new Fire TV Cube, which has Alexa control. So although we have the digital product, we will not use it. Now I will be sw switching to Roku to avoid this in the future. Or perhaps there is a way to require a passcode or I can unlock orders via Alexa. Unicorn Boss gives it four out of five. I absolutely love this trippy indie sci-fi quantum physics movie. So there you have it. It sounds very confusing. You know, it, it is and it isn't. Yeah, it, yeah. It's not, but I agree with, I think the problem is the ending. Yeah. I remember liking this film, but then never really being that interested, which when you said the ending's a letdown, I, I bet that's why, because they got yeah. to the end. Oh, this is interesting and wild. Huh. All right. It has <laughs> so much potential to be, it really does feel so close to being as good as Coherence, but then... Yeah, you get to the end and you're like, why did I just sit through this? Yeah. Like, what what was, it could have been way more relevant and I just feel like they dropped the ball. Yep. Yeah, coherence was definitely, if you want that kind of a feel, go watch that. All right, well, <clears throat> again, let me remind you, I'm dealing with my allergies. So. <laughs> Everyone looks very puffy today. Like, <laughs> I mean, myself I, included. But. I, I'm just fat. But <laughs> <that's> <laughs> not different. I need to thank our friend Steve Holitz from the Bat Bone Bat Podcast and Film Festival for gifting me the Blu-ray that I chose because oh. he had accidentally bought a double. Nice. And what I chose was uh, <clears throat> House 2, The Second Story. Last year, audiences everywhere thrilled to a terrifying film about the horrors of home ownership. House is an all-new house. It's like you got some kind of alternate universe in there or something. With brand new owners. Charlie. Hmm? Got it. And it's getting weirder. Look, it's a prehistoric bird. I've seen enough tragedy and disaster to make you want to upchuck in your shorts. 
two friends inherit a fantastic house. Charlie, there's a jungle in there. And a 170-year-old mummy. Surprise! Who is this? You can call me Gramps. They're in for more trouble than they ever imagined. You can kick the door open, run in there blindly, and I'll cover you, okay? Guy with the big gun goes first. Two, a second story. This place gives me the creeps. Yes, <laughs> yes. Wow, uh, <laughs> that is a, that. You know what? That's all you have to say. We're done here. <laughs> from 1987, I saw this back in 1987. A budget of anywhere from three million to seven million, and a box office of ten million. Obviously, if it was made for three million, this is a much better box office than if it was made for seven million. <laughs> the Rotten Tomatoes critics give it 7%. Oh, Aww. damn. That's the audience gives it 42%. Yeah. <laughs> Written and directed by Ethan <laughs> Wiley, he wrote the first house movie, which surprised me, um, and also wrote and directed Children of the Corn 5, Blackwater Valley Exorcism, and a couple other films. It stars Ari Gross. You would know him from Soul Man for the Boys, Minority Report, and uh, just a ton of 80s <laughs> rom-coms and comedies and stuff like that. He's yeah. one of those guys. Uh, Jonathan Stark, who is in Fright Night and Project X. Mm -hmm. Laura Park Lincoln. She was in Sky Sharks just recently, but I knew her as the <laughs> telekinetic girl from the Friday the, Fir Friday the 13th Part 7 movie, oh, sure. The New Blood. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has Bill Maher in it. From <laughs> DC Cab, <laughs> Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death, and uh, just for being Bill Maher. That's what yeah. you probably know him from. Mm. And then it also stars Royal Dano, who um, was an old TV guy, mostly known for TV westerns, uh, 197 credits. Jeez. In his later years, though, he was also in Messiah of Evil, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Ghoulies 2, and The Dark Half. Okay, you have both seen this movie. Yes. yes. Me you fairly love recently. love it. Oh my God. It's off the hook. <laughs> I will say this. I remember not liking it in 87 and liking sure. it quite a bit more this time. Oh, good. So it opens uh, like 25 or 30 years in the past. And there's this young couple in their very strangely decorated home defending <laughs> yeah. it from this fairly decent looking zombie cowboy who is demanding that they give him the skull. Um, he kills them, and then we bump up to the present day where we meet our hero, Jesse, who has returned to the family mansion that his parents were murdered in when he was a baby. This house is not the house from the first movie, right. and it becomes very apparent right from the start because whoever designed this place <laughs> had it all done in ancient Aztecian style. So weird. <laughs> Bass relief designs all over the place. And you would think that I would go for a place like this, but uh, I... I couldn't get into it. It looks ridiculous. It, yeah. It's very cheesy. Um, anyway, Jesse is there with his girlfriend, Kate, and his good friend, Charlie, and Charlie's girlfriend, Lana, who wants to be the next Madonna. Um, so while they're going through a bunch of things in the basement, Jesse and Charlie find a picture of his great-great-grandfather, also named Jesse, in front of an Aztec temple holding a crystal skull with sapphires in the eyes. Um <laughs> Also in the background of this photo is a man that Jesse learns is called Slim Reeser, who was a former partner of his great, great grandfather. And they became bitter at me when they had a disagreement over who would get to keep the skull. So making a gigantic jump in logic, <laughs> he and Charlie decide to dig up the corpse of his great, great grandfather <laughs> who was buried on the grounds sure. because the skull must have been buried with him, right? Shh. Uh, let's do that. <laughs> um, well, they do. Yeah. And it is. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but the corpse of Jesse attacks them when they remove the skull. And it's a fairly funny scene. I, yeah. I should let you know that this is a comedy more than it is a horror film. Yeah. Um, Jesse finally convinces the corpse that he's family and they take him back to the house and get him set up in the basement downstairs. They decide to call him Gramps. <laughs> um. <laughs> 
Gramps is also very distraught when he realizes that the crystal skull has not brought him back to life, but just kind of reanimated him as a walking corpse. Also, the subplot going on around this is that Kate and Lana are trying to impress Kate's boss, who is Bill Maher, who is a smarmy jerk, which works well because he plays a smarmy jerk in this movie. (laughs) I actually like Bill Maher quite a bit. (laughs) Um, He's over at the house regularly, so the guys are constantly trying to hide the weirdness of having a corpse living in the basement, and, and it's a lot of 80s television comedy. There's a lot of Three's Company in this script. (laughs) <laughs> you know, hiding stuff from Mr. Roper kind of stuff. <laughs> um, Gramps finally explains that the house was built using stones from the Aztec temple that they got the skull from and that the rooms are all doorways to different dimensions and the skull acts as a key. He basically tells Charlie and Jesse that they now have to defend the skull against the forces of evil who are drawn to it regularly. So during an impromptu Halloween party yeah. thrown by Charlie, uh, Gramps makes an appearance, mm-hmm. <laughs> but Perfect he's time. overlooked, uh, because he looks like he's just in a great costume and he's having a good time. Nice. Gramps looks a lot. The whole Jesse name was throwing me off cause he looks a lot like a dead version of uncle Jesse from the Dukes of Hazzard. <laughs> I mean, that's what he looks like. Kate nice. <laughs> ends up leaving Jesse and taking Lana with her after he is seen with an old girlfriend. And Jesse and Charlie end up in a Jurassic age where they must fight a caveman and a stop motion pterodactyl that is actually pretty great and completely unexpected (laughs) in this kind of story. It is actually a ton of fun. And they even end up with a bizarre caterpillar dog that is dubbed a caterpuppy. Yeah. It's a good... How did they get in there again? Was there like a hole in the wall or something? There is... Well, remember the... The skull ask, acts as a key to different dimensions in the uh-huh. doorways and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a hole in the wall scene. Uh, what they call an electrician, uh, John Ratzenberger, <laughs> who uh, gives him a card that says um, electrician and part-time adventurer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he ends up making a hole in the wall uh, when he discovers the weirdness of the house. He actually pulls a short sword from his tool case. <laughs> and leads the boys through uh, one of those time portal things. You see these all the time in these old houses. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, from there, the movie goes completely bonkers. Um, they, they end up saving a virgin who's about to be sacrificed. Um, they time jump to the Old West and have a shootout with uh, the zombie. And then they have to fight an entire police force that has surrounded the house. Um, this movie actually was a lot of fun. I, I know why I didn't like it in 87, sure. because I liked the first one and I it's wanted so more different. of the first one. Yeah. yeah. And it's written and directed by the guy who wrote the first one. Isn't it the same actor too? No. Oh, no. okay. Right. No, because that's William Catt in the first one. Oh, okay. 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 So um, I did watch a little bit of the extras and because I thought this had to be a different script that they just tossed the house name on. And when I found out it was the same writer, they were just like, <laughs> Well, we're not going to be able to get William Cat back. He doesn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get uh, Richard Mulligan, who was a zombie soldier from the first one. They were like, let's just make it about a different house. And then they gave him like two weeks to write the script. (laughs) And he was like, I wish I had had a little more time. (laughs) (laughs) He did really good for two weeks. I mean, it's pretty fun. It's, It's pretty silly, but it's also 80s comedy silly, you know, it really broad leaps in logic that you would be like, is it, would you really act like this? But then you're like, there's a cat or puppy in this. You, yeah. So I'm going to let it all go. <laughs> a little bit of trivia. Uh, to aid in the promotion of the movie, a number of giveaway items were sent to theaters, and these included crystal skull nightlights and cat or puppy figurines. Oh, Once wow. I read this, I went on to eBay yeah. and scoured it for anything like this. I can find no evidence oh, that this man. actually oh, happened. Dear. I couldn't even find pictures of it just looking for it. Right. Wow. Um, Ethan Wiley, the director, he had that crystal skull then turned into his doorknob for his house. Oh, that's so good. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, I thought this was interesting. Several pieces of music in this were also used in Friday the 13th, part six, the previous year. This was produced by Sean S. Cunningham, uh, 
and so of course for the Friday the Thirteenth movies, and then that uh, Laura Park Lincoln girl ends up in Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. So mm. everybody's this is a very incestuous sure. film. Eighties horror movies. <laughs> I do have one review, <clears throat> one star <laughs> from Trash Gang. God, maybe just maybe a toddler would be frightened. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like the original house, but naturally I had to see the franchise. <laughs> but wow. what a mistake this was. Thousands and thousands of flicks I have seen since the end of the 70s. All horror and sci-fi, but this here is just one utterly boring flick that I even use the fast-forward button. A thing I normally never do. House was, house was one for teenagers, but this here is for toddlers. Ethan Wiley, also involved in House, did wrote and directed this dull <laughs> flick. Oh my God. The best part is only the last 15 minutes uh, at that part are a few nice effects, but overall it's just a family film in the tradition of Harry and the Hendersons, 1987. <laughs> I was like, well, Harry and the Hendersons is a pretty decent movie. Yeah, yeah that's like a, it's a fun one. This but, guy just doesn't love life. But here's, here's where I realized uh, we are dealing with a douchebag. Go ahead and put this stuff out in public. You people, I love knowing it. Um, he ends it with gore zero out of five. Nudity, zero out of five. Effects, two out of five. Story, one out of five. Comedy, zero out of five. If you rate your movies on how much and how good the nudity is, yeah. I already have a pretty good mental picture of who you are. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and, absolutely. And there's somebody out there doing it a shitload better than you are that I'd rather listen to. <laughs> oh, man. I, um, I appreciate this subgenre because I'm not sure that I would have watched this movie anytime soon again, <laughs> even though Steve had gifted me the Blu-ray. Uh, so it allowed me to, you know, watch a Blu-ray in my Blu-ray player, yeah. you guys. And, you're and uh, you found the slot for it. <laughs> yeah, all right. Hey, you know. And I, uh, I had a good time with it. I was like, oh, this is cute in a Harry and the Hendersons kind of way. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I love this movie, but if you like the first one and want it to be anything like the first one, I mean, first of all, I don't think the first one's a teenager horror film. It's about nom PTSD. Yeah. So yeah, and, what? And the losing a child. <laughs> yeah, and losing a child. What are <laughs> well, you talking about? I'm, I'm guessing whatever the guy's name is wasn't Trash Gang. There you go. Wasn't working <laughs> hard to find the depth and meaning of a movie when mm -hmm. you're First two things are gore and nudity. <laughs> well, also, you know, he starts the review with, uh, I didn't like the original one. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I decided watch I'd watch the next one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, well. You're not renting from Blockbuster anymore. You can watch something else. All right, right. <laughs> um, Vanessa, I think you have the pick for next. Week. Yeah, you know, I was so happy and enthused last <laughs> week when I did um, Ghost Rider 2, Electric Ghost de Lou. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know what, let's just go ahead and do the Nick Cage thing. Um, let's each pick a Nick Cage movie from his vast <laughs> catalog and uh, just, yeah, have a little explore, see what we find. Excellent. I like this idea. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it has taken us this long to get to a Crazy. A Nick Cage retrospective. Ah, no Crazy. Kidding, man. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to the part where we thank everybody for yes. donating, mm -hmm. for liking and sharing posts, for doing all of the stuff that you guys do for us. Yeah. Just for uh, raising our morale. Thanks, guys. Yeah, no shit. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, thanks to all the folks who emailed me about the uh, Crypticon letter we talked oh, about a couple weeks right. ago. Or last, whenever. But uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was... <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I was at least privy to one of those because uh, our friend Craig had ah, yes. thrown out his um, experience with people like that. Uh. Oh, well, it's kind of disheartening that there are that many people out there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And uh, honestly, if he had just defended his film, I would have been fine because you know what? Defend your film. Go for it. Sure. But, you know, then including all the crap, throwing Crypticon Film Festival under the bus and all that stuff. of you don't know what you're talking about. Just cut off those last two paragraphs. I would have gone, okay, all right, and ignored it. But, you know. <laughs> well, and of course, I've become obsessed with this guy. Oh, have you? And, and so I check in on him regularly. And uh, this movie <laughs> that is the greatest thing ever, um, you know, he posts something and it gets two likes. 
and one of the likes is him and stuff like that. And I'm just like, mm, well, I hope, I hope you make it, dude. Yep. Yep. I, just I hope will. you learn. No, I hope he fails miserably and learns a lesson <laughs> and then stops sucking as a human. That's what I would like. Tell us how you really feel. That's the only way you'll learn. Okay, so that's it for the episode. Make sure you hang out afterwards and hear our hot Batman talk. That's right. And then we will be back in one week and we are talking Nicolas Cage. Oh, yeah. Okay. Man, Vanessa, you loved this movie. I loved this movie. And I watched it for the second time now that it's out on HBO Max. Mm. And I, I could barely get through it the second time. Oh, really? I liked it the first time. I, I liked it the first time too. I haven't seen it a second time. I liked it, but at the same time, I'm glad I didn't see it in the theater. Really? I, I kind of feel like I might have needed to see it in the theater. Oh, to forced. I mean, well, I did see it in the theater. And I, I was, I mean, I think that's why I liked it. Yeah. Because watching it the second time, I was bored out of my mind. Oh, no. And I, I just hate Robert Pattinson as Bruce Wayne. Mm. It's there. There are weird choices in that character, man. Yeah. E e even down to the hair. It's like, well, what, maybe why a billionaire especially the hair. That kind of a haircut. Especially a good looking billionaire. You're going to go and make yourself look good, not make yourself look like a 14 year old emo kid. Mm. I, I thought he looked great as Batman. And I yes. love this costume. And I yeah. love the collar. And I love the boots. And I love all of that stuff. And I, of course, love the Batmobile. Why did this movie have to be three hours long? I have no idea. It is yeah. it is a very thin plot for how long this movie is. Well, you had said some stuff that kind of made it sound like it'd be a little more origin stuff. So I expected, because I'd heard a lot of people oh. say that the beginning is really good and the ending's really good, which I kind of agree with. Yeah. And I thought the middle was going to turn into like a flashback of a new version of his origin story or something. Oh. Where you're talking about like duct tape masks. I thought it was Batman was oh. doing oh. a makeshift thing. So I'm watching for that going, going oh, okay, I guess it's not going to be that, which might have helped. Right. <laughs> I mean, we all know Batman origin, but we don't, so we don't need to have it. But yeah. But uh, another thing I thought was kind of funny was when him and Gordon were talking. He's like, yeah, what do you think's going on? I don't know. How about you? What do you think's going on? I don't know, man. <laughs> all I know is we are all fucking serious all the time. <laughs> um, we don't need to see Batman's origin, except he as Bruce Wayne, he is such a recluse now in this yeah. mm -hmm. that you kind of want to see how this version of Bruce Wayne would possibly decide he's got to put on a costume and fight crime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's interesting because we are dropped mid-story. We are definitely not dropped in the decision yeah. to do this. Now we have a signal or something like that was yeah. one of the opening lines. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like I, The reason why I didn't want you to skip the opening wasn't because of the origin story, but because of the concept of him walking around and people being wary like oh, the first cool. time of this that. yeah thing in the shadows and that was the first time i had watched a batman film going fuck he could be in any of these shadows like which <laughs> shadow was he in yeah. and that really resonated with me for the you know for uh the first time in a way that i hadn't seen in other ones but i i can see if i did a rewatch of this i'm sure it would not be as interesting and it would probably be boring, but it, it is shocking to me how many people on Facebook in the last three days have come out and been like, Batman fucking sucks. And I'm like, whoa, okay. I, I didn't, didn't think it sucked. That. And no. I thought it looked really cool. Yeah. I think I would have liked it shorter yeah. so that the look uh, didn't get old yeah. because yeah. just the gray through the entire movie started getting old at about mm -hmm. the sixth hour. <laughs> and it would have been cool to have like a, a pop of green or something for the Riddler character, a pop of just a weird thing like that City, looked like yes. when they're looking at his apartment, just a, a weird pop of something would have added, it would have been kind of fan service, but I think it also would have added a little bit of variety to mm -hmm. what you're watching. That's interesting. I kind of like that idea. Yeah. I think something like that would have been cool. I also, the, this was basically seven. With Batman. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Which is seven or Zodiac or, you know, which is kind of a cool like idea. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe, you know, I think I like that. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw on the HBO uh, Max version of this, they have a, a scene that was deleted that you oh, can watch. No. I've heard about it, but I haven't watched it yet with the 
Right. It's him going to talk to the Joker who is yeah. in Arkham oh. and he's asking him about, you know, what do you know about this kind of person? So it's basically a Hannibal Lecter mm. moment. Mm. And I was like, well, this is actually pretty interesting. Yeah. I would have, I would have liked to have seen this in the movie and maybe something else cut instead. Mm. Well, the um, end, maybe when Joker does his appearance, I'm going, God, you know, that. at this point of the movie, you can have a Batman movie without the Joker. It's fine. It's okay. There are a lot of great <laughs> other villains we could look at for Scherzies. Yeah, that was the only part of the movie that I was like, fucking cut this whole scene. Why? Well, if they had that initial scene kept in that you were just talking about, that probably would have at least tied that together. Yeah. But. Yeah. Also, uh, okay, so this was very, very much, I think I was telling you, um, Batman or Earth Prime, I think is what it was called or something like that. Mm. Um, it's a four issue series that was written in the early two thousands, maybe I can't remember, but it was basically the same story, uh, with the Riddler, uh, planting bombs and going to flood the Gotham and all of this stuff. So I, I was like, okay, that's interesting that you've taken this kind of bizarre little Elseworlds Batman and mm -hmm. gone with that. Um, what t two things the interior design of his skyscraper house yeah. looks like a gothic church yeah that was mm -hmm. weird and i was like uh, no <laughs> i mean it's if this were a tim burton movie i guess i oh, could yeah. okay. buy it but you've made it look ultra realistic and then he lives in a skyscraper that has been hollowed out to look like a church <laughs> Does he live in a skyscraper? I think I missed yeah, that. Yeah, he was living in Wayne Tower or whatever when the that was. Explosion, that's when the explosion went off for Alfred. That's yeah. when I, I didn't realize it till then. And that's part oh, of ways into the movie. I had no but he idea. looks up and the explosion's coming off of a skyscraper. Right. Oh, I did not put huh? that in Yeah, he's not, he's not living at Wayne Manor or anything so there's like no that. Oh, I thought cave? he was at the manor. <laughs> well, the back cave was the train tunnel underneath <laughs> yeah. the skyscraper. <laughs> yep. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I did not get any of this. So this is all news to me. And I was really thrown out right at the beginning when the, uh, the gang of kids on the subway, mm -hmm. the kid who's got like the half makeup face on, yeah. that's the kid who plays Tim Drake in Titans. So I was oh, like, okay, that's right. What that's is, familiar. is, are we going to see his, this somehow tie into Titans or something? And, and we never get back to that kid. I thought right. that we we're going to see one scene where it's like, He's turned his life around. He yeah. saw vengeance and uh, decided he had to do something about it. Hmm. But I don't know. I, the more I talk about it, I'm going to talk myself into really hating it. Yeah, so. don't, don't do <laughs> yeah, that. Right. I, I mean. I would have been fine, too, with the instead of I'm vengeance, if they've kept the I'm Batman. <laughs> yeah, that would have been cool. I, like, when he said I'm vengeance, like, oh, I'm actually a little disappointed in that. That's right. <laughs> I love that cartoon of... Uh, Batman is, I'm vengeance. And then you see Robin next to him and I'm his sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. But, um, uh, and I thought the, the mask choice for Catwoman was odd. Mm. And bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a, it was a, I wouldn't have minded. I like the tiny little ears. I yeah. wouldn't have minded if, um, the slot for her eyes had been tailored instead of just torn. Right. Or torn, even torn like it was actually torn as opposed to torn and then nicely <laughs> fixed a little bit. It's not torn that much because she's, you know, she's neat. Right. <laughs> but she still had to tear it open. It's like, well, this, this is, and what, what, so she just bought a, a knit cap with ears on and pulled it down over her face. And uh, yeah, it was, that was weird. Especially weird when you look at this absolutely fucking awesome reimagining of the Batmobile. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, okay, this is really different, but really cool. <laughs> it even sounded cooler than yeah. any other yeah. Batman. Penguin um, was weird. And why Colin Farrell? That was the strange. They're yeah. literally actors who look like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, was Colin and Colin Farrell wasn't exactly doing an accent or anything that was Irish that you would want him. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I guess for vanity, like, yeah, look what we did. Yeah, I don't know if that was him saying, look, I can really act, yeah. and I, I know I'm an asshole, but I can really act, and please keep mm. giving me work. I'm willing to sit in a makeup chair for three hours a day, if that's what mm. it takes. Mm. Yeah, the, the penguin is just a, 
he's just a side gangster character. Yeah. Is this strange? I under I've seen you've seen the evolution of that character if you watch or read much of it. But I always still find it kind of disappointing that they've just sort of turned him into a colorful gangster. Mm. I almost he's like my least favorite Batman mm-hmm. villain. He has always been my least favorite, especially when he would like shoot shit out of his umbrella or mm-hmm. use it to glide mm-hmm. down to the ground and shit like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm fine with never seeing the penguin yeah. in a Batman movie again. You know, I'd love to see me some killer croc or oh, you know, yeah. any of his rogues gallery. That's not been touched yet. There's so many of them. Yeah. And it's always Riddler. Well, it's always the fucking Joker. And then the Riddler and the Penguin come along a lot of times. Every once in a while, you'll get another one. But not very successful, usually. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's have a Mr. Freeze. Mm-hmm. That's not. <laughs> also, can we just get a fucking... I don't care how many actors play Batman, but can we just pretend that's all the same Batman? Mm. They, we could like do a, yeah, we could do a 007 thing with Batman. We don't I, have to have, you know, a new Batman and so then it becomes a new story of who this person is. I think that they're really excited about the multiverse though. I think that that's the thing that they're really ramping up for. So that's my guess as to why they're just like, yeah, and this one and this one. And Mm. like, I don't know. I don't know. The flash is going to be an interesting film when we start to see all this shit come together. Uh, It's not going to be, it won't be no way home. Right. Oh, I know. Oh, one, I know. One grim, dark movie of a bunch of grim, dark guys getting together. Well, recast oh. of the Flash too. A recast of the Flash. Yeah, the um, guy from the movie or the, from the TV show is supposed to be playing him now or playing him next. Hopefully. What? I don't. Yeah. I don't know if that's know for, if for that's sure, but I, I thought the the guy who's playing the Flash got himself into some kind of oh, trouble yes. again. Yeah, yeah, over and over. So yeah. then they were Billy talking about issues. replacing him with that guy who I think. Could, I liked the Flash TV show overall. Yeah. I think he'd be a fine replacement because he's, he was kind of an annoying little shit in the <laughs> Justice League movie. For sure. <laughs> mm, yeah. But that's not him as an actor. That's just the character. Right. But uh, <clears throat> he didn't help it. <laughs> I think, yeah, Ezra Miller's uh, really, I don't think, I don't think anyone wants to have anything to do with him anymore. <laughs> I think they're just like, you know what? Forget it. You're not worth it. Even if, you are what everyone sees as the flash. We just can't with you anymore. So, well, this is clearly one of those things where we're, we're watching somebody spiral and yeah. it's going to go very badly if somebody doesn't step in and, yeah. and get him whatever help he needs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. That's it. I think unless, yeah. uh, anyone else wants to bitch about Batman, uh, I want you to see it again and tell me what you thought. I don't want to, cause I don't want to ruin it. I, had well, such I don't a want good you to experience. ruin it, but I, I was just like really surprised how bored I was. Interesting. I mean, I can give it, I can give it a go. If I decide to watch it again, I think I'll watch it as a three part TV series. <laughs> watch an hour one night, yeah. an hour another. Night, Cause that was, it was like, there'd be moments where I'm going, huh, okay. Oh, wow. Well, this is interesting. Okay. 20 minutes later, I'm like, hmm. right, right. but if I stop it now and come back later, <laughs> maybe it'll be better. <laughs> oh man, I did love, loved that shot in the end when he's leading the people through the water and he's mm. got the flare. Yeah. Uh, like oh, that looks so cool. And it, Hey, it has light. <laughs> <laughs> it had some very cool scenes in it. There's I thought some- the, Car Dope chase was you know, spectacular. Yeah. The car and... chase was great. The come on, the bit where he fails at falling off a building. Yeah. It's very good. Mm-hmm. It's very good and very upsetting. A, a lot of stuff that I thought was really, really good in it. It's just uh mm. I don't know. Yeah. As much as I liked him as Batman, I was I was just so disappointed with him as Bruce Wayne. Mm. Wonder if there's gonna be a producer someday who's got the guts to pay for two actors. We're gonna have Batman, and we're going to have somebody else playing Bruce Wayne. Oh, wow. Oh, be All you have to do is get their jaw type similar. <laughs> mm. And anymore, you could just make their jaw type similar. Well, this, and I think this version really is hinting at the idea that Bruce Wayne is the mask and Batman's the real version of him. That's what they were doing with this. Yeah. They yeah. almost say that in one scene. Yeah. Where he's going to have to learn to be this millionaire playboy and he's not even remotely, he's at his deepest heart, the Batman. So I, yeah, it's interesting. That's definitely interesting. After Alfred 
got injured in the explosion. Mm-hmm. And Bruce goes and talks to him and finds out, you know, oh, this guy killed my parents, all that stuff. We never go back to Alfred. Yeah, that was, we not, not? That was a mistake. I was Aww. just like, oh, what happened to Alfred? Poor Andy. He's a big part of this. He's done. I am done with Alfred. <laughs> You're out of my life. <laughs> Instead, we get the shot of, of Batman and Catwoman on their bikes, which and they appear to be on a building, and then they drive off together. And I was like, well, where were you? <laughs> yes. He escorts her out the city. I don't like that bit either. Yeah, I think that network. whole thing could have been cut too. Like she could just be like, he could stand somewhere and watch her drive off. It'd be fine. That was, yeah, it was very weird. Yeah. It's like, what are they racing? What are they, is this supposed to, are we, are they flirting? Is that what you're trying I to pretend that to be? I think that's what was going know. on. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. But it, that was, that was not It was successful. too, that was too long and yeah. unnecessary. As corny, almost as corny as it was. It was still cool when he gave that rousing speech kind of thing mm-hmm. about being the Batman and what it, rep- yeah. what it represents. That yeah. It's not just fear. I would have loved if the movie ended yeah. right after that. Same. Done. Same. And well, you don't, you, if you want to do the Catwoman thing, do it as a post credit scene and get rid of the scene with the Riddler and the Joker. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree because that's the thesis of the film. Yeah. He starts by saying, I am vengeance. And he ends by going, the city doesn't need vengeance. It needs hope. And I have to be hope. Like that's the entire yeah. point of the film. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, well, we're, we're set. Oh, we got to set up our sequels. Hold on. Yeah, <laughs> that's sucks. right. <laughs> sucks. I'm hope. <laughs> 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 and you can bring in Superman. Bullshit. <laughs> okay. Other than that, I have no feelings about this film. <laughs> Brain Geons Radio is artisanal quality podcasting, handcrafted with all natural ingredients, and edited to perfection by Eric Morgret. Our blistering theme song is Strange Eons Part 1 by the band Nightshade and is used with permission. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider dropping a positive review on Apple Podcasts. It, it wasn't that bad. It was a little awkward. And then I got two years of free HBO, so it was fine. <laughs>